Hi, welcome to the latest edition of NAMI New, York, NAMI New York State Perspectives, your video series to keep you connected, supported, inspired as we not just survive the COVID-19 crisis, but learn how to thrive through it. And today we're joined by a spe really special guest and a great friend to not just NAMI New York State, but the whole mental health community. Um, New York State Con or Congressman Paul Tonko of New York's 21st District. Thank you for joining us, Congressman Tonko. Hey, my pleasure, Matt. And I hope everyone out there is staying well and doing their best at social distancing. It's a, an awkward time for all of us. And for those of us who are out in the community a lot, it is like a very uh, challenging um, readjustment. Yeah, I'm sure. And it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, I saw you in person, face to face, right before this whole uh, epidemic really started to sink in. I think one of the last public events I was at was the uh, the Dustin Mealy event, the yeah. Memorial Conference. Yeah, out of the dark, yeah, out of the darkness effort. And uh, wow, what a great job um, they do with the uh, the musicians to raise funds for suicide prevention and for mental health advocacy. Just a great group, and every year it seems to grow larger and larger. And yeah. uh, you're right, it was just before the onslaught of social distancing, so we snuck that one in. Yeah, it, ju it just got in, and, and but even then it was interesting. You could feel the dynamics change, you know, doing the, and, the elbow bumps instead of handshakes. And, and a huge dose of the Beatles, because it was a Beatle theme, so right. for the we, Beatle fans out there, it was uh, something. Yeah, which is always, Beatles are always good during uh, difficult times, but uh, First and foremost, of course, how are you doing and, and everyone around I'm you? Doing, I'm doing well. We're all like my DC crew and the district crew are all working, teleworking out of home. Um, but that is like hours a day. You know, yeah. I think you tend to start earlier because you just cruise from that cup of coffee, which I don't have, but they, mm -hmm. many do. Um, and then sometimes they find themselves working at 10 and 11 o'clock at night. So it's mm -hmm. like really maxing. The, uh, the contact with one another. Uh, we, I'm doing conferencing uh, with my colleagues with caucus calls, New York delegation calls, uh, constituent networkings, uh, group workings. Um, and the same is true with our crew. They're doing constituent services and advocating to the, the leadership in Washington. So, you know, it's nonstop, but uh, it's a challenging time, but I think we're meeting those challenges. You know, certainly, and thank you, not only to you, but your staff that is working so hard. You know, I know talking to Diana and Rachel as we were putting this together, I know the district offices here in the capital region and the greater capital region, you have a very big district here, which includes urban and, and some rural areas, very interesting district. You know, you're hearing a lot of things in your district offices. Can you see, tell me some of the things you're hearing from constituents right now? Sure, a lot of people are concerned about the healthcare side with PPE, with the personal protective equipment, uh, certainly with uh, the appropriate amount of masks, the um, R95s, which are important to the frontliners, masks in general, gowns, gloves, um, and ventilators, you know, there was uh, a real, with New York being the epicenter of this uh, coronavirus, um, I think we've kind of been at the head of the curve and a lot of states are watching how we've performed under the, uh, the duress. But, um, you know, we hear a lot about that, but then also hearing about those who, who live with mental illness yeah. and the threat of coronavirus has instilled in so many of us an unprecedented feeling of fear and anxiety. And I've got to believe for those living with mental illness, this stress uh, is uh, perhaps very much magnified. So we're um, doing our best to, um, to be there and respond. Right, and, and certainly, and I, and I put up on the screen, you know, New York did, has done such an amazing job uh, reacting to the mental health aspect of this and making sure that that wasn't overlooked. And, to Governor Cuomo's credit and Commissioner Sullivan's credit, they, they got this helpline together so quick. I know that it's getting a tremendous intake of calls. I've spoken to people who are taking the calls. It's really been a remarkable thing, A, to get this effort launched, but the reaction to it. And I think people are realizing more than ever before how important their mental health is. So again, when you look for good things that have come out of this crisis, I definitely think that's one of them. The, the, well, and I think it, on mental health. 
Right. And Matt, I think it's fair to say that, you know, while we're living with all of the, uh, the stress of the moment and perhaps not doing with certain things um, that we would like to have at our fingertips, it does at the same time remind you what the priorities are out there. And right now, the priority for me is to make certain that every American, certainly every New Yorker, is provided the services they need so as to have that peace of mind in this time of incredible uncertainty. So um, we'll continue to go forward with that. But right. what kept us really busy uh, in the weeks prior to the, package, the passage of CARES Act was actually putting it, um, ourselves deeply into what would be included in that package. And I was proud of the fact that we led a bipartisan letter that eventually um, secured 74 signatures from members of Congress that went to the speaker, Speaker Pelosi, um, to encourage her to include mental health services in that CARES package. And so we were successful in securing $425 million uh, for emergency uh, mental health services so that um, we could address the mental health needs and those uh, concerns for substance use uh, programs, uh, yeah. including $50 million, I believe, for um, suicide prevention. Yes, $50 million. And, and one of the things that we were excited, too, is $250 million for certified community behavioral health clinics, which they right. are not in every state, but they are here in New York, a lot down state, but they have been very successful and it's more integrated care. So that's really uh, a very Right, and it's a program. demonstration. So we're hoping to learn from it, Matt. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was important not to abruptly end that demonstration. In fact, with the uh, CARES package, we extended the uh, deadline uh, or the sunset on that program until November 30th of this year. So it'll give us additional time. And I think we expand the demonstration program to two additional sites. But you're right, there are some, um, 13, I think, of the community, um, the certified community um, uh, behavioral um, health um, organizations across the state of New York. And uh, these centers are very important. Uh, and we have many included in upstate New York. So hopefully we'll learn from that modeling mm -hmm. and be able to provide more um, effective treatment for those who required it and respond with uh, much more compassion and sensitivity. No, thank you for fighting for that, and, and we, we deeply appreciate that. But of course, and I know you've heard this, and, and you and I have discussed this, there are a lot of people say that the CARES Act didn't go far enough, and I know you, the, you and your colleagues are very hard at work um, to take the next steps on, on part four or, or four, however you want to call it. So can you discuss some of the things that you want to see in the next steps of uh, the CARES Act? Sure. You know, everyone keeps talking about the front line. And you see there's signs in my hometown near the hospital with huge hero signs. You know, people are being recognized as being yeah. heroes. They're putting themselves at risk in order to save lives and, uh, and cure people of the um, corona virus of the uh, COVID-19 issue. And I'm concerned about the mental stress that is coming on that front line. So um, I've initiated a bill that would um, network with our National Institute, National Institutes of Mental Health, um, where we would have a study of the mental health impacts of those uh, on the front line of the COVID response. I think that it is important to do that because for their wellness and their um, being, well-being, uh, we want to make certain that we analyze and understand just how to address the stress that they've enduring, been, been enduring. And so hopefully that will, I'm introducing it as a standalone bill, but I'm hoping that it would be incorporated into the bigger package, which would be um, CARES 4 or Supplemental 4. Everything's got different rhetoric mm -hmm. on it, but it would be our fourth such response after the very first three that have been initiated. Also, I think because we did a major effort in CARES for nursing homes and hospitals um, with a huge package there, I think that uh, we need to do a tens of billions of dollars worth of investing in our behavioral health organizations mm -hmm. so that those um, organizations that speak to the um, behavioral health, those that are particularly 
um, connected to our local providers will be assisted. We need to shore up that infrastructure because um, it's obvious that everyone is dealing with additional stress and anxiety. And for those, again, living with mental illness, mental health disorders, it's important to have these organizations getting assistance, getting relief from Washington. So that will be one of my major boosts along with the uh, study with the National Institutes of Mental Health. Um, then I also, because Medicaid is still the largest contributor to mental health services, mm -hmm. I wanna make certain, Matt, that we boost the emergency um, efforts for Medicaid, making certain that, making certain that FMAP uh, funding be um, provided so that the challenges to our Medicaid systems uh, won't deny services, but rather mm -hmm. be bolstered so as to be able to provide what will be an added bit of services that are required, I have to believe. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the uh, more programmatic things I want to do. Uh, but then, you know, we've also included in the first iteration on CARES, when we presented our um, House of Representatives package, we included a 30-day um, startup of Medicaid for those who <clears throat> are eligible for Medicaid that are incarcerated. And we mm -hmm. wanted to make certain that before your release, 30 days before your release date, that there be programs be set up that are set up to address the, uh, the mental health needs and the treatment for substance use. Um, that didn't make it to the final package and I want to re-up that effort so that um, we can be more compassionate to those who are uh, incarcerated. And we're hearing those numbers now that Very COVID scary. is yeah. getting pretty rampant yeah. in, the, um, in the incarceration yeah. uh, uh, settings. And so we want to make certain that that restart of Medicaid 30 days before the release date is included in, uh, in the COVID-4 in, in the Supplemental 4 bill. Yeah, well, that all very important issues, and, and thank you for leading the way on, on getting them, especially the Medicaid issues. You know, we're hearing a lot of concerns about billing and being able to get reimbursed from both providers and uh, peers. So that's so important. Thank you for fighting for that. You know, as we discuss the challenges that, that we're facing right now, Congressman, you know, I think it's a very NAMI way of looking at the world that we're used to challenges. When, when you're living with a mental health issue or you're, you're supporting someone who's living with a mental issue, mental health issue, excuse me, you know, crises are going to come up all the time. You know, we're used to that. You, you've see, heard from our families. You've helped our families, especially on suicide issues, on, on parity issues. You've always been so ahead of the game. But, um, you know, one of the things that we've also learned as, as NAMI members is to learn from these crises and, and to grow from these crises and, and use them as an opportunity to strengthen yourself. And, and one of the things that's been really inspiring to me that I'd like to see you talk about is, is even though we're socially distant right now, and I don't like that term because we're more physically distant, I think we're still very socially connected. And, and you're seeing that in the ways that the communities are trying to rally together, you know, the donations to food banks, trying to, you know, we're right. in Bethlehem, which is here in your district, and, and watching a lot of the local businesses try to adapt and seeing how the community is rallying around that is something that's very inspiring. So can you talk about that kind of internal fortitude that New Yorkers have, especially here in your district, and right, you know, supporting each other? I just talked to our regional food bank um, director, Mark Quant, yesterday, and they provide assistance to, I think, some 23 counties in upstate New York. So they're far reaching. And they're doing their very best to meet the ever increasing numbers at food pantries, at uh, soup kitchens, uh, delivering packages to homes. Many communities are doing that. And they're assisting in that regard. And they have volunteers that, you know, we have people asking how they can volunteer for that. And so they have a website. Uh, we offer that website location. Um, in our media that we do from our office, but you see this constant surge of volunteers looking to find ways to help. There were teachers in the district who in their off hours when they're not um, uh, distance learning with their students that are delivering supplies to households for, their, for the children, um, pencils, new, uh, pads, all sorts of supplies that they'll require for those students who live in need. So. Mm -hmm. 
you know, there, you see this time and time again, people that are preparing meals and then they're delivering them to hospitals for the frontliners. I mean, there's just such a surge of human compassion, of humanity, that um, it, it really makes you proud to represent an area that is so connected and so devoted to being neighborly. I think that that's really important. So, you know, it just reminds you that you have to keep fighting for those programs that will keep people intact. And with these stressful times, we wanna make certain that the mental health programming is secure. One point that I did mention for what I wanna see in, in Supplemental 4 is uh, the need to bolster the money for the substance use prevention and treatment block grants, yeah. making certain that those dollars are there We'll probably advance some 250 million. That's the number I think that would perhaps be at least sufficient right now. And then, of course, you know, I've had this legislation that wants to avoid having to jump through the hoop at DEA. If you're um, a provider, if you prescribe opioids for pain management, why can't you be there to assist those who are living with the illness of addiction? And so we're going to try and include the language to eliminate the special DEA waiver to uh, prescribe buprenorphine for opioid use disorder. Um, hopefully that, um, that will work and work well. And to um, continue to build upon, make certain that the CARES Act, which included uh, the ever popular or the more um, discussed, I should say, 42 CFR Part 2 elements that uh, enable more substance use information to be uh, integrated into our electronic medical records. So there's all sorts of efforts here to provide for um, the safety nets in a time where some of these things could be skipped over if not brought to people's attention. And because of our long-standing uh, association with NAMI, we feel like um, we need to be that voice so that uh, these programs are not forgotten and that uh, the many, many people with whom we've partnered over the years will be um, heard and heard very clearly. Well, thank you. Something we say often at NAMI too is that hope starts with you and you're really an epitome of that, Congressman. Thank you so much for all you that you've always done from your time in the assembly when you were fighting for Timothy's Law to ha to make sure we had mental health parity for both mental health and substance abuse issues. It's a fight we're still fighting. New York, I think, is still leading the way on this and being very yeah. Isn't it a great, Matt, isn't it a great feather in the cap that we were the first government entity to provide for mental health parity? I believe we preceded the feds. Yes. That fight was waged we beat them by, by a Senator, year by the late Senator Ted Kennedy yeah. and, um, and his son, Patrick Kennedy, who was a representative. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they did yeoman's work. But for us to have lined up that parity issue as the first in the nation, mm -hmm. you know, it goes to show you, I, I'd say all the time, there is no greater constituent advocacy group than that of the mental health groups in, in the uh, New York State arena. I, they were just stalwart in their efforts of trying to get the parity bill done and forever feel bonded to that, uh, to that partnership. And it's still a big, and you know, the, the exciting thing too, not only were we the first, but we don't rest on our laurels here either in New York. You know, this current budget, even during these very difficult times, you know, we just passed our New York state budget a couple of weeks ago and it did include the, the parity compliance fund. So, you know, that fines for uh, providers that aren't adhering to parity are gonna go into this fund to help expand the parity ombudsman program to provide resources for people to, to fight uh, against parity issues. And it's, it's very encouraging that we keep moving this uh, issue forward. And yeah. you know, you, it's you, all because of you, because you got the ball rolling. Well, I don't know about that, but yeah. thank you. But um, you raise an important no, uh, point. Um, since I arrived 12 years ago in Washington, just about 12 years ago, I find one of my roles to be like a watchdog over the implementation of parity yeah. to make certain in this day and age where people want to undo regulations, they think they're doing the public some good if they get rid of regulation. Mm -hmm. I'm right there fighting to make certain that uh, we have a watchdog uh, within the federal agencies to make certain that parity is strictly implemented to the letter of the law. We don't want any reduction in, in the sense of parity. So 
um, a good effort for all of us to uh, uh, embrace as a as a as a sense of mission. Definitely, and obviously more important now than ever before. You know, one thing I want to get back to a little bit. We were talking about community and the community rallying together. You know. In New York, especially in politics or in the state, how you hear so much upstate versus downstate, and and you know as we're dealing with this crisis and addressing it, you're seeing it more as one New York. You know, supplies from upstate going downstate. When they're going to be needed upstate, they're going to come from downstate. And I think it's a beautiful thing. And I know one of the things that was really touching. I know the governor is focused on it, is is the nursing home in your in your, our district, your district. So that donated, I believe, 37 ventilators down to New York City. And, right. and what that means that we are one New York right now. We're all supporting each other and getting away of that upstate, downstate thinking. We're one community right now. Well, absolutely. The sense and spirit of compassion uh, is important and was expressed uh, very nobly. Um, and, you know, I know that hospitals that I represent um, volunteered their efforts to take some of the um, the overload onto the uh, the system, and uh, those people have been uh, uh, cured and uh, they've been treated um, in a successful manner and have returned home. And so um, I know that the efforts made by some, several of the local hospitals um, contributed greatly to that stressfulness of uh, the epicenter. Um, on some of the counties uh, as far north as Orange County and Rockland County, Westchester. And I know that it was like a fire rap uh, spreading rapidly across Long Island. So, you know, let's hope that the curve now flattening continues as a, uh, as a uh, pattern. And um, let's hope that we're through the worst of it. But it's a, it's a frightening virus when we listen to the scientists. They, uh, there's a lot of unknown here. Yeah, there is a lot of unknown. So we are running out of time. I know you, you have, uh, as, you, as you've detailed, uh, so a lot of work to get back to, to, to get us moving forward. It's not about going back to where we were. It's about moving forward. I think Absolutely. that's an important distinction. But, you know, um, one of the ways we, we try to um, wrap up these episodes is by giving somebody, giving our viewers something to watch or some media recommendations. And I usually try to make a special recommendation for each of my guests. So I do have one special for you. Um, yes, sir. You know, earlier this year, unfortunately, we lost, other than maybe you, one of the most impactful people to ever come out of Amsterdam, uh, the actor Kirk Douglas, um, who was born and ra who was raised in Amsterdam. Um, he has his incredible autobiography, The Ragman's Son, which if people haven't read it, it's just an incredible documentation of, of perseverance and strength and, and going from a, a poor immigrant European Jewish family to move to upstate New York and Amsterdam and, and to struggle. We talked about the struggles that, uh, you know, led to him becoming not just a, a, a huge Hollywood actor and starting a, a dynasty, but so much of what people need to hear right now about perseverance and moving through hard times, where, whether it be the, you know, the depression or, or the other uh, challenges that previous generations faced and how you move through that. And of course, you know, the Douglas family is also a part of our greater community. Um, his grandson, Cameron Douglas, not mentioned in the book, but has struggled with uh, addiction and ended up incarcerated and, and is doing a lot about, uh, you know, bringing awareness to these issues too, which is so important. So I don't know if you had anything to add about one of Amsterdam's oh. favorite sons. Yeah, I can, I can tell you that my mom, who grew up in Amsterdam, was raised in my hometown, um, went to high school with Kirk's sisters. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, everybody kind of marvels at the fact that these big time celebrities on screen in Hollywood actually emerged from small town USA. And so there's a lot of beauty that emanates from small towns. And it's just nice to know that, um, you know, there's a, um, there's a, a nurturing that uh, an environment that produces the best in people. And um, I think he would probably look at those roots and say that many people inspired him locally to go on and be uh, the student that he was, the athlete that he was, because a pretty good athlete, yeah. uh, and uh, the actor that he became, you know? 
they were all somewhat a product of the environment that produced us. Yeah. And small towns create that environment of nurturing. Right. And so it reminds us to all be nurturers. Let's right. see it as our goal. And you used a word earlier that is my favorite, hope. Yeah. Let's provide hope. Let's work together in a multitude of ways, in bipartisan ways, in political arenas to make certain we accomplish all that we can so that we are delivering hope to the uh, doorsteps of people. Well, there's no better way to end this conversation than with hope. So thank you so much, Congressman Tonko, both for taking the time to talk to us this morning and, and for all your insights. And of course, for all you're doing to not get us back to normal, but to move us forward and, and to make us Absolutely. better, coming out of this better than we were before. So we really appreciate well, it. Matt, thank you for the opportunity. And I feel I'm, I cherish the, uh, uh, the, the gift of, uh, of being able to partner with the mental health community. It's been one of my greatest joys in public policy. Um, there was no better moment than that mental health parity. So, you know, to all of you who feed me with ideas and, and goals, keep it coming. Let's provide hope for the people. All right. Well, thank you so much. And as we say, hope starts Stay well. with you. Stay well, certainly. Thank you, Congressman. Okay.